Thanks for joining another episode of Micah Stocks. And today we have a very, very special guest. Karen Feinerman is the CEO of Metropolitan Capital Advisors, which she founded in 1992. She's a permanent panelist in CNBC Fast Money, the 5 p.m. show with Melissa Lee and others. She's also on the board of the Michael J. Fox Foundation of Parkinson Research and a trustee of the Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx. Hope I didn't miss all of that. And just to top everything off, she's an author of Feinerman's Rules, secrets I'd only share with my daughter about business and life. I would love to welcome Karen Feinerman to our show. Hi, Karen. How are you? Good. Hi, Micah. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Excellent. It's so fun having you here. You know, I see you every evening, almost every evening, 5 p.m. But some of my viewers, which are in Israel, don't have CNBC. So I would love for you to share a bit of your background and how you got to investing. Yeah. So um, my background is I, I grew up in California and I uh, my father was a doctor and I had a very sort of a traditional mother homemaker. But the main thing she told us was you have got to make your own money. So I was one of five, four girls and a boy. And mainly for the girls, she would say, you must be financially independent. And I saw how my father making the money gave him all the power. And I didn't ever want to be in that position. So not long after that, I read an article about a guy named Ivan Boeski was how I thought you pronounced his name because I'd never heard him heard it spoken before. Yeah. Your viewers are probably a lot younger, don't know Ivan Boeski, but he was an infamous insider trader. In the okay. 80s. I didn't know then he, he was an insider trader. <laughs> I knew he was a risk arbitrageur. And uh, this was when he, you know, before the blow up. And I thought, wow, that seems great. I want to do that. I want to be a risk arbitrageur and tra trade stocks on takeover deals because it seems exciting and fun and you can make a lot of money. And that seemed like a good thing to have, to be free, to do what you want. So I told my parents, listen, I'm only applying to Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania because I want to go to Wall Street. And if I don't get in, then I'm not going to college. So that was that, a very dumb plan. That's a and very, yeah, that, that's a very, very uh, very great pl plan to have at, at such a young worked. age. Uh, it worked. Yeah. So, um, uh, so and thankfully they took me, I'm now on the board of Wharton, uh, many, many years later. And, um, and then I came to wall street and, um, you know, I started working for a family named the Bellsberg family. I don't know if you know of them. No. And then they kind of blew up in 1990 and that was sort of the first blow up that I had ever seen. And then I went to a big investment bank. And then my partner from the Bellsbergs in 1992, he said to me, why don't we start a hedge fund? And it was a fantastic idea. Timing, as anyone who's had any success knows, timing has so much to do with it. And our timing was superb. You could have been the worst hedge fund manager in the world in 1992, and you were going to make money. Sounds so, like 2020. <laughs> uh, kind of, yeah. 20, if you weren't bearish, you were going to make a ton of money. So, and then, uh, you know, so I've seen a lot of fads come and I've seen a lot of them go. And then uh, I, I was in a magazine, uh, there was an article about women on Wall Street. And um, so I was one of the women and two of the producers at CNBC who had created Mad Money with Jim, Jim Cramer, yeah. uh, created this show Fast Money. And they asked me if I wanted to be on it. And I had no TV experience at all, uh, but I thought, you know, why not? First, I thought, oh, I don't know, fast money. That sounds kind of sounds sleazy know. a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a hedge fund manager. You know, do I want to ruin my reputation? And then I realized I'm a hedge fund manager. How much of a reputation do I really <laughs> have anyway? So what the hell? I'll try it. And it's been a lot of fun. And uh, to, to my great surprise, here we are 15 years later. And I, I, I got to tell you, and you know, we talked a few minutes before that. I, I love the show. I think it's a great panel with uh, a lot of diversified opinions. And I, I'll, I'll even flatter you for a second. You didn't hear from me first before that is when days are really red and when markets are down, mm -hmm. if, if there's something I don't like, and you're the opposite, so you'll get the flatter in a second. Mm -hmm. I don't like people sitting there and saying, oh, I told you so. 
it's gonna <laughs> fall and you're like guys my portfolio is bleeding as well and just like and we all we all quote Rothschild saying that when there's blood on the streets even if it's mine then right. then you buy so exactly. I, I love those quotes every time yeah so, great great and that's why I you know once I got your approval to have you on the show I said you know we we gotta have this I ha gotta have this discussion and, and the first question is because of your background of managing portfolio one of I think the biggest challenges in the last few months was the what's called the volatility in the market or mainly the sector rotations I want to say on a daily basis weekly basis monthly basis you can focus on tech and And the week later, everything goes to energy and then healthcare and then financials. Mm -hmm. How does a hedge fund manager work in these kinds of climates and this kind of volatility? Because at the end of the day, the viewers that I have, the, which manage their own portfolio, are basically small hedge fund managers of their own. They're portfolio managers. Yes, they're managing their own portfolio, the most important portfolio to exactly. them. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And so it's hard. It's hard to manage when, you know, some things are really in favor for a day or two and then not. So I really don't trade around. I feel like, you know, if I were imagining all the portfolio managers as traders sort of running towards one thing and then the next day running towards another. If you've ever if you have small children and you've ever seen them play soccer, that's how they play soccer. They run in a pack. All towards the ball and then they go and and half of them never touch the ball and so um, I don't do that what I try to do is understand the companies that I know the, and the, the sectors that I understand and like and I buy and sell a little but on any given day I may do very few trades sometimes I do no trades and then if they really get stretched one way or another, then I'll maybe take a position or I'll do something in options against my position. But I'm really not trading around. I mean, Micah, you and I talked a little bit before the show. You have to be very tax efficient, especially in the United States. We have complex tax rules. And so to me, the idea of selling something, getting that, that decision right, and then, then when, knowing when to buy it back, getting that decision right, and making enough In between to pay for the taxes that's a very hard that's like you know a triple whatever uh, level difficulty and I, I can't do that I I'm not a market timer and it out it actually saves me from myself and so I generally hang on I take the blood on the street marks like yeah anybody else and that's okay that's okay and one thing I look for is is when stocks tr start trading down integers at a time that's interesting to me because i know there's something else going on it's not about valuation it's about panic and psychology and if i can be on the other side of panic um i can do that i'll be happy to do that even though you know i'll probably get a little bloodied in the interim yeah and 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 you know you mentioned the trading we'll talk about that later in charts and fundamentals but At least for the next, you know, now we're talking April 12, at least for the next nine months with the CPI data out, with the rate hikes, whether it's going to be eight rate hikes, whether they're priced in or not priced in, or everyone has their opinion. But it's clear that in the next six months, the markets are going to be volatile. That is clear. Whether there's going to be eight rate hikes, six to half a percentage, and then they're going to pause. Everyone has their opinion. You probably have your own. One, I would love to hear your opinion on how... The next six months are gonna are gonna go do you believe that Powell has the the Fed, the head of the Fed has enough I want to say guts to get us into a soft landing or hard landing which means in plain English a recession which might be short and then we'll lift off again or he's gonna blink and At the first drop of the S p by 10 15 percent to the 4,000 level of, or 3700 and then we're gonna run stimulus checks again what what are your thoughts and it's all gonna happen very fast that's why it's very kind of tactical it's not strategic it's not really investing in five to ten years yeah I, I don't think he's gonna blink actually I think that uh, clearly his tone has changed dramatically from transitory inflation to very hawkish. Yeah. right and so 
And, and it's interesting to me. So last week in his press conference, he was very hawkish. And then what they do is they send out several of the other Fed governors to repeat the hawkish, hawkish message to make sure everybody gets it. Even they before, they Brainerd. actually send yeah. Brainerd before. Yes, right. Well, Brainerd, yeah. And I thought Brainerd was an interesting choice because I think of her as the most dovish. And she was quite hawkish. So they really want to, they don't want to surprise the street. They're going to do what they have to do, but they don't want the street to be surprised. They want them to start doing the work for them. And so I think they have to stick to it. They can't let inflation run away because remember, now we have all this debt. Higher interest rates go, the more expensive that debt is to service, the more of a drag that will be on the economy if they mm -hmm. don't, if they aren't able to wrestle inflation to the ground. Yeah. So I think they are going and I think we know they're going to do many hikes. Yeah. We know yeah. they're going to tighten the balance sheet. Those two things together, I think will have will have an effect on the economy. I think a recession would be rather short lived, though. And I, I think that the prior administration was really a thorn in their side, you know, tweeting and yelling yeah. at them and um, And then think, and telling them they're going to fire them, basically. <laughs> basically, right. Um, I don't, the Biden administration, I don't think uh, is operating under that same uh, logic. I think they're going to get, I think they're going to honor the independence of the Fed. And so uh, I, I believe the Fed. I think, I think they made a mistake in 2018 by reversing course. Yeah. And it, since it's the same people, I think that they can look back to themselves, to the scars on their back and say, okay, maybe yeah. we made a mistake. Yeah. So if, if that's your belief, where do you think, and this is guys, this is not financial advice. Everything is just a discussion. Um, yeah. Where do you think the regular investor, whether they're young investors or veterans for the next let's say 12 to 18 months, because we don't know if it's going to happen in the next three months or in the next 12 months. So let's say 12 to 18 months. Should they stick to technology? Should they expand to other avenues like healthcare, like energy? Where do you think or how do you think that my viewers should kind of build their portfolio or rebalance their portfolio? Right. Well, I can tell you how I, I've balanced my portfolio. Excellent. And um, so for, for a while, I have been bearish on the super high flyer tech names. Uh, they just they didn't make any sense. And so, you know, if you've been around a while and you saw the Internet bubble of 2000, you see that things can trade to crazy prices and they can trade down 80 percent. The Amazon, the, the Amazon anecdote, yeah. which everyone lo loves to quote. Yeah even great companies and then some terrible companies trade to zero so um you know well I, so that just seemed crazy to me however there are a lot of big tech names that i actually think represent value so for me my biggest position and has been for several years is amazon is uh, alphabet google yeah google and you know when i was just looking at it yesterday if you back out the cash which is well north of 100 billion dollars It trades at a multiple of 20, 20 which times is, P. Which is amazing. It is amazing for a company with the margins that they have, with the, with the moat that they have, the power that they have, and all the money they spend on moonshots, which I'm yeah. not saying they shouldn't spend, but just that, that just, even after all those losses, the power of that business is extraordinary. So that's a big position for me. And so it's been my biggest position for years. I think, um, Meta platforms, which is Facebook, also it trades it trades much cheaper. It trades at 15. Yeah, now it's now now it's now, become a value stock. It is a value stock now. Um, so this is one I've had a long time. I really did not do a good job selling it when it was much higher. But I just I think it's an extraordinary business. I think they will find a way around the Apple privacy issues and be able to build to continue to build on their advertising business to small businesses. Uh, it's, a, it's a very unique property. And so that's the kind of thing I want to own in a, 
inflationary, non-inflationary, whatever it is, um, recession or not, I think that that's where I want to be. Um, I think as long as people are employed in the United States, which I'm mostly a U.S. centric focused investor. Yeah. Um, as long as people are employed, which they are now more than we have ever seen, I think you're going to see people spend money on clothing and discretionary items. One thing I'm less optimistic about is um, the auto business, uh, the boat business. Um, I feel like they've pulled forward so much demand, and now we're in a in, in somewhat of a log jam where they're trying to build cars because there is still some current demand. But I feel like by the time they get those cars delivered, given what's happened to energy prices. That reminds me very much of 08 yeah. when they could, you know, they had SUVs, which they love to sell because they're such high margin items, but they couldn't sell them because people were not buying gas guzzlers. Um, people were not buying them. So um, I think we could see that again. I'm actually, I'm very rarely short, but at the moment I am short uh, Brunswick, which makes boats. Yeah. Um, not because I think they do a bad job. I don't, but I'm looking at their projections and they see growth of 10% annualized for the next three years. I find that a little bit hard to believe, especially with interest rates going up. A lot of people get a loan for a boat. They take a hundred gallons of gas, right? And, uh, used boat prices will come down. So that's sort of to me on a, on a yeah. bit of a, of a, of a bubble. And, and and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put you on the spot on because my channel finds oh, itself right. no my channel finds itself talking a lot about Tesla as uh, when you look okay. at the financials when you look at the growth I'm putting aside Elon for a second let's put I know you can't but Would let's put him put aside. aside Elon but yeah, go yeah. ahead yeah. yeah we know look we we cover we cover it extensively so but I do want to you know if if you talked about that kind of the auto industry. When you look at their pipeline of orders, when you look at the, their ability to push prices up to their uh, consumers, when you look at, and you know, we live and we see the amount of Teslas in the streets. It's, it's crazy. You know, in my street, there are like eight or, or, eight or nine Teslas just in, in a very small town. So um, it sounds like that is a very safe haven these times, you know, even after everything you said, it's a free cash flow company. They produce, they're, they're profitable. Their profit margin goes up. The revenue exceeds itself. They're supposed to grow at least 50%. They just open new factories, putting aside the Shanghai lockdown right now, assuming that will ease off in the next right. few days. You know, uh, I agree on the auto industry, everything you said, but there's kind of the outlier, which is Tesla. And correct me if I'm seeing it in the wrong way. Okay. And it well, might sound like I'm a Tesla this. fan and it might be the case, but... Again, yeah, I'm looking yeah, at the facts. Tesla, being a Tesla fan has been a very, very good thing to be uh, for a long time. But let me ask you this. Is there a price that you wouldn't pay that much for Tesla? Not the car, but the company. Is there a price where you say, you know what? That's just too much. Today, all those of course. Stock price today, of course. And we'll get to that when yeah. we talk about charts. Of course. Uh -huh. Right. So that's that's what gets me stuck on Tesla. Okay. Is just the idea, you know, how they're valued so much more than GM and you know multiples of GM and yet GM makes three times as many cars, right? And, um, GM, but that GM is that is exactly the area where where I where I kind of stumbled and and that's where I have an issue. I want to say every time there's a segment on Tesla I have an issue because GM is producing a lot more of something that in a year or two years, no one would like to own, at least from my perspective. So the I depreciation the there uh -huh. is you're buying some, you're, you're buying a Nokia phone when the iPhone one was introduced. Yeah. Or you're holding a Blackberry when I, when the iPhone one and maybe iPhone two even. You still love your BlackBerry and you still believe that the keyboard is great. And I also had a BlackBerry. I but still it, miss my BlackBerry. I, I agree with you. I can't type on the iPhone. I, I, I think they're bad. 
something around the leather on their back was so comfortable. I agree with you. But at the end of the day, all of us has all of us have iPhones now. Right. And right. thinking of buying an ice car and internal combustion now and, seems to right. me like you're you're just throwing money in the wind and saying, you know what? I don't care losing 50% of the value in three years because that's what's going to happen. At least it happens in Europe in some of the countries. And that's where I think the comparison to GM and Ford, that's where I think it's lacking. Now, would I buy it today, April 12 at $1,500 a stock price? No. When it got to $1,100, I told my viewers, guys, it's crazy. A stock cannot go up 50% in, in two weeks at a market cap of $1 trillion. But still, I still think that a company that grows 50% and has the profit that they have and have that amount of cash, I don't know. And I'd love to hear, you know, because it seems like, you know, when I'm sitting at home, people on the other side, I don't know. You tell me, what, what am I missing? I, I mean, I come to the same question then. Is there any price you would buy GM stock? Of course. Of, of course. course. Same, same right. answer. Yes. Yes. But a lot lower so, than today. Okay, where? Let me just point out one other thing about GM. GM's balance sheet is very misleading. They have way less debt than it appears. And so the actual enterprise value, which is the stock market capitalization plus debt, less cash, is actually much lower than it appears. So to me, um, it, it seems like it is pricing in the termination of the ice business, maybe not in two years or three years, but in five or six. And so it does have a, albeit quite small, but I think it will grow meaningfully, EV business. It does have cruise automation, which in itself is probably worth $20 billion. That, that is, in my opinion, that's right? their biggest moat right now. Yeah. So, um, so I think... Uh, yeah, uh, and we're not. I, I don't want. I don't want us to have this discussion because all my viewers know that. But on GM, just and then we'll we'll dive into charts because I think it exactly goes back to what what price. And then at the end of the day, it's not only evaluation; it's also timing. But on GM, I think the minute I would like to put my money on a GM stock is the minute that I hear Mary Barra, which is their CEO, admitting to where they really are in the market right now. Keep saying that. You're going to lead the market in 2025, but you don't have more than hundreds of cars being delivered on the EV space. Mm -hmm. To me, it sounds really misleading. And I understand why she's doing what she's doing. But at the end of the day, as an investor, I'm asking myself, maybe that's exactly what she really believes in. And then, uh, then and that's, that's where that's my, my challenge is with GM specifically. Again, that's GM. Right. I mean, Mary Barr has had a couple of missteps. I, I like her, I like her a lot as a CEO, but she's had some embarrassing missteps. Nicola is one, yeah, for um, example. For example, and you know has been slow to partner. Um, they've been slow getting out. I think the Hummer seems interesting, but they're slow to get it out. The Lyric, which is the Cadillac, Cadillac has been doing great, but yeah. uh, the the Lyric will really not be out until next year. Um, I think the truck looks good, uh, but also it's not going to be out for a while. So we'll and that see. and that is exactly and that that's where my challenge is. Okay, let's uh, we dive okay. we we really and, and I can have an hour discussion on that because I okay. you know and I tell my viewers I would love for once to have someone that doesn't understand the Tesla story but understands the markets and have that discussion because maybe I'm missing something. Or maybe the market is missing something. I don't know, but I agree with you that at the prices right now, it ran too fast, too high. And, and I'm, I'm happy that it's, it's going down. And actually, I hope it will go down a bit more. And I know my viewers hate when I say that, but I would love to pick up more stock at 700. Right. Well, I think Tesla, you know, the, the, one of the, the bear cases about Tesla, after the bear cases used to be they'll never be able to fund their way out. Correct. Early, they were able to do that. Another bear case is competition. And we haven't really seen competition yet, but I do actually believe that is coming. If you look at- I agree, you know, it will come. And Polaris and, you know- um, uh, Yeah, it's gonna come, it's gonna come. There's gonna be competition for sure.
Right. And so I just don't think it can continue to get that valuation. But uh, who knows? Only, only time I, will I tell. Short it, I wouldn't short it. <laughs> For sure. There are a lot of people that have... Uh... Yeah, that needed to cover that short. So we talked yeah. before and I didn't I didn't intend asking that. But, you know, we talked about, um, you know, evaluations is evaluation of companies is clear. You do a deep fundamental, you understand the company. But I get it through the comments and we kind of you mentioned that. And it's great hearing that you started looking at charts in a different way. I'm not yeah. going to mislead you. I'm not going to uh, put words in your mouth. So go ahead and, and tell my viewers what has changed in your view on charts versus, I won't say versus, but in addition to fundamentals. Okay, so fundamentals are really my tools in trade. But for sure, being on this show has taught me that it doesn't matter if I believe in charts or I think they're ridiculous. What matters is if enough people believe in charts, and see the same thing and you know they'll hypothetically say well there's a floor at $50 and if enough people believe there's a floor at $50 they'll buy the stock at $50 that's true so okay i got to accept that doesn't matter if i think it's dumb or not that, that makes no it's difference it's the algos i blame the algos okay so whatever the, that's a reasonable answer whatever it may be that therefore it is legit right if enough people believe it so that they act on it then in fact that chart will tell you something it's it's not that that was i you used to just dismiss it entirely but i i can't do that anymore so uh, one, one step one step forward to the toward the the technical the carter worth of the world exactly. um, I do love carter, though. yeah carter's great, amazing yeah. he has great calls definitely one last question because we're running out of time and that's connected to investment, but also something that I know is very dear to your heart is women in investing. Yes. I am doing all the efforts possible to get as many women on the channel to be exposed, to take responsibility of, of their financials. And you mentioned, just like you looked at your father and you said, I want that independence. And I know you're doing a lot in that avenue. Can you share with my viewers, first of all, your view and of course, if, if I'm a young, I'm, I'm not, but if I were, if you were talking to a young investor, a young woman, a young girl that is thinking of investing, what are the best tips you would give her? So the best tips I would give her is to don't put it off because you're scared that you don't know anything, right? Um, you know, uh, male investors are in the same boat as you are. And yet, for some reason, they feel like, all right, I've got to do something. And so, you know, just getting your feet wet. And I think it's that part, just that first step is really important. And there's nothing wrong with buying an ETF like the SPY, right? Which gives you a tiny bit of every company in the, in the S&P 500. There's nothing wrong with doing that as a way to start investing. That may be the very best thing to do, right? When you own the, the spider, you, and I wouldn't trade around it. I would just dollar cost average, you know, every month or whatever yeah, yeah. it is, very little in, and hang on to it. And then you'll start to you'll start to see that you're more interested. You're more interested in reading the, the business section or the Wall Street Journal. And then you may decide, all right, there's specific companies I want to put a little money in. And you can't, women sometimes are afraid of risk. But sometimes doing nothing is the riskiest thing that you can do, right? If you're in a Especially rising- Especially in an inflation, inflationary- exactly. So your dollars left in cash will buy you less. And so you have to just get started. Don't think that doing nothing is riskless. It isn't. So that's important to me. And don't assume that everybody else seems to understand things and you're the only one who doesn't. No, that's not the case. Many people, myself included, don't understand many, many things about investing. And yet, you know, I find a way somehow to do it. I find, you know, um, ETFs are a really easy, good way to start. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And and, uh, and thank you for sharing with that with my viewers. And again, thank you I'll very, very much. Thing, if I might, about that. Yeah, think go about ahead. A career, think about a career in finance, right? I, I Women don't. I was at a work meeting the other day and a finance professor said to me, you know, half the class 
half the 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 student body uh, give or take yeah. is women and yet finance which is really the 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 most popular um major at wharton is less well less than half and why is that yeah and i said to me it's you know if you're a finance major you want to make money mostly that's right yeah and that's women seem uncomfortable with that as a goal they seem like it you know they feel like it's not appropriate it's it's uh it's good for men but maybe not for women i don't get that i don't know why you wouldn't want to make your own money so i agree i'm with you me. on that i have two girls i have right, i have uh, a son and two daughters both of them are i don't i don't distinguish by their gender my daughters play all the sports in the world you know i keep sharing with my viewers every saturday every sunday i drive an hour to soccer yeah. games i coached yeah. their teams i know exactly what you said about the every uh, when they're young the whole team runs after the ball from one side to the other yeah. now she's older so it looks like a soccer game um <laughs> but i'm with you on that that's why i'm trying to promote it and and i love bringing more and more people that promote that agenda to create that equal well equal number between and you know i i have those statistics on youtube for the viewers and we just saw that between nine to eleven percent of the viewers on the channel and this is the biggest channel of investing in israel so if you're a hebrew speaker you're probably seeing this channel in one way or the other because there's an, an, an i don't think because i'm that good is because there's nothing a lot more than that so you're something. yeah um but it's nine to eleven percent and that's not the ratio in the population. No, nine to 11, that's yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, it is. Wow. So Karen, thank you very, very much for spending the time with us. I would love to have a longer discussion, of course, on, on a lot of other topics and, and hopefully you'll come again to the channel and uh, we'll have those discussions. Thank you very much. We say in Hebrew, you probably know uh, that saying. Uh, so, I know. yeah, I know, I know. Not enough. That, it's embarrassing. <laughs> have you been to Israel, by the way? I have not. Really? I, I don't have a good, yeah. You know, my daughter, one of, I have two sets of twins, and one of my younger daughters, she said, are we half Jewish? And I said, you're no, Jew I think Jewish. you're full Jewish, right? Yes. And she said, what? Well, we don't do anything. I'm like, all right. Well, that was years ago, so now we got to do a little more, which we've done, but I, I am not, I'm not a very, uh, not a very... Active. So you sh so I'm not I'm not trying to I live here just like you but I'm not trying to promote but it's a beautiful country to travel in. I know I've heard it's spectacular and yet I haven't been but anyway. no, maybe right. maybe right. maybe you'll come maybe you'll come to my uh, viewers conference that we might have in a few months <laughs> be the guest right. speaker. <laughs> Karen, thank you very very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And guest. to all my guests, okay. thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.